Today on the Johnny Kerberg Show, is there scientific evidence for life after death? Numerous studies have been performed to evaluate the accounts of people who have been pronounced clinically dead when their doctor saw no heartbeat, that is no EKG, or no brain activity, that is no EEG, or both. Yet after a while, the patient amazingly returned to life with some fantastic accounts of where they had been and what they had seen and heard. Some saw and heard people say and do things five states away, but their material physical bodies never left the room where the doctors pronounced them dead. Many do not realize that between nine and 20 million Americans have reported near-death experiences according to the 2017 book, The Science of Near-Death Experiences by the prestigious University of Missouri Press, a highly acclaimed book that is the world's first peer-reviewed series on the science and medical aspects of NDEs by medical professionals. Such experiences compel scientists to ask, is there more to our lives than just our material bodies? If so, what is it? What happens when a person has a sense that their mind or consciousness is functioning apart from their physical body? Or when their consciousness is in the vicinity of their physical body and then goes and sees and hears things 1,250 miles away? Is it proof that after our material bodies die, we still continue to exist somewhere? If so, where do we go? In our three program series with Dr. Gary Habermas, he reveals stories and statistics that point to a spiritual realm. And since Jesus died and physically rose again, where does he say we will go when we die? Dr. Habermas takes us through six levels of near-death experiences, from near-death experiences in the ambulance to near-death experiences from the congenitally blind people who see something real, like colors people are wearing, to heart death, to brain death, and eventually to irreversible biological death experiences. So join us for this special edition of the John Akerberg Show. Welcome to our program. I'm John Akerberg. Thanks for joining me. And as you've heard, my guest is Dr. Gary Habermas. He's an expert on the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. We're talking about the topic of near-death experiences because they open up the door to, is there an afterlife? Okay, scientists today are tracking near-death experiences in ways they've never tracked it before. They're tracking it with their machines. And so medical doctors can say, this, 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 this is a characterization of this person on the table. He should, for all purposes, be dead and nothing's happening, but he's having an experience, maybe in the next room or in the next state, okay? And we're gonna talk about some of these cases that have actually been documented, okay? And here's an interesting fact that Dr. Habermas brought out last week, is that a serious study put out by the University of uh, what, Missouri? Missouri? University of Missouri Press. Press. They said that between nine and 20 million Americans have had near-death experiences. Define what a near-death experience is, Gary, and then talk about the five categories of what is called, how do we know we're getting close to death here? on the near death is, according to the list I gave of definitions, it would be the lowest definition. A near death individual, I, I mean, they could be dead, they could be beyond the higher categories, but as far as anybody knows, they've just passed the initial stages, perhaps of no blood pressure, uh, no pulse, and you're in the ambulance and you're on the way to the hospital. And those folks often report things that people there hear. I mean, I've had two cases where as the person is being loaded into the ambulance, they say, I was up above my body and I watched you load me. And I didn't know there was a number on top of this ambulance. Well, yeah, there's numbers on top for tracking if you have to do it with a helicopter or whatever. But the person reported the number on top of that. Well, if you're strapped down down here, someone's not going to be sitting in the car in the ambulance going, ah, car, you know, 
This is our, what do you think about number 413? You know, you, you don't talk about the number. So near death is a state from which you could reasonably be thought to die if you don't get some immediate intervention, and that's the whole idea of 911. So the five categories, some skeptics actually uh, want verifiable information inside a room while the person is out. Hopefully, <laughs> this is horrible, but hopefully in a state of, of cardiac arrest, ventricular fibrillation, from which they return, but that shows that the heart's not working. In a very short time, in some experiments, 15 seconds, the upper brain activity stops, measurable upper brain activity. So if you're, re if you're reporting something, uh, say a minute, two minutes later, that's highly evidential. But the second category would be if you're, the material you're reporting is a distance away. So floors in the hospital, back at your house in the city, across the state where a brother's praying for you. A lot of these people are attracted to family members when they, when they uh, say they're up above their uh, body. Okay, third case, Indy is in the blind. Fourth case, oh, and in the blind, people gravitate to the cases where the person is congenitally blind from birth. Yeah, you're so, talking about people that cannot see, have a, an experience, and they might go into another state and see a person that they've never seen before and actually see them and they come back and they're still blind, but they describe it. They can describe the color clothes the person was wearing and, and so exactly. this is what we're talking about, okay? Exactly. The fourth one, fourth and fifth are Twilight Zone type ones. Four is cases where someone who's very healthy, in one case it was a nurse, people who are very healthy get drawn into the NDE with the person and said, I didn't know what was going on, but I was watching the person go down the tunnel and I came back with them. You know, so you have, I mean, I've, I've got a case or two here that's like, you know, it's like, oh yeah, you're going to make a movie out of that, aren't you? You know, but the last one to me is the most intriguing and that's where somebody else has met. You return from a near death state but you learn some information from somebody who's been dead for two years, 10 years, and they report something that's verifiable. Yeah. And um, th th some of these are very uh, evidential. Yeah, and atheists and skeptics have looked at this evidence and uh, you know they don't wanna say there's an afterlife, but here you have John Beloff in the Humanist Magazine. I said this last week, but I wanna say it again. In the Humanist Magazine, he's argued that the evidence for an afterlife was so strong that humanists should just admit it and attempt to interpret what happens in naturalistic terms, okay? So we've got skeptics that are taking notice of this and it's busting up their worldview and they're saying somehow we gotta deal with this. Now let's start with say some of these lower categories and give me illustrations, real life, that have been cataloged, documented. Okay, inside the room. There are some cases, I, I don't know what it is, but we've all seen tennis shoes on the roof of buildings, uh, people, you see, you know, girders above your head and somebody will try to flip a penny to get it up there. We do funny things with things above our head. Sometimes near death uh, patients have been up above their body and they'll say, you know what, funny thing, there is a Jefferson nickel on top of that girder over there and when I saw it, I kind of zoomed in on it, and it's a 1988. And sure enough, when the person comes to, they sent a janitor up there. That was a nickel, all right. 1988. How'd you know that? I saw it. I was up there. Well, kind of hard to say. You know, you start limiting your options when the person reports data. Yeah. Uh, another one. Some of them, the the most interesting ones, are not necessarily the highly evidential ones, they're the strange ones. Yeah. Like in one case, the person came to and the doctor came in to talk to him later and they said, we already got figures on that. And that machine was plugged in. You, you wouldn't know because you were out during, uh, with anesthesia, but that machine was plugged in. And the patient said, I'm sorry, doctor, the machine was not plugged in. When I was up above my body, I looked over there and I wondered, I don't know if somebody kicked it or what, but the plug was lying on the floor. Now, how would you? 
How would you know that? And the doctor checked it out. They went back they... and checked it. The plug is lying on the floor. Yeah. Um, now this one, this is so close. I guess we could might as well say it's in the room. It actually was through the next wall. But a person was in surgery, and they're up above their body, and they're watching. But when they're in this state, like I say, of the world, Narnia, something, they're going, wow. I mean, I guess this is the world I live in, but it, the colors are more realistic. It's whatever. And they don't pay attention to what's going on. I mean, kill me if you want. I'm, I, I'm ready to go. And they drifted over through a wall into another surgical room, and they watched a man having his leg amputated. And they described the amputation surgery while they were on the bed in this room. Now, that's reported in a book uh, edited by a friend of mine, Janice Holden, who was for years the editor of the Journal of Near-Death Studies, the only peer-reviewed medical journal devoted to uh, near-death experiences. And it's reported in this, in this book that's only been out for a year or two. Uh, okay, so those are ones in the room, mm -hmm. outside the room. Uh, there's a very well-known case from years ago where a little girl drowned in a pool. She was known not to have heartbeat for about 20 minutes. There was a physician to poolside, and they brought her in. As far as they could tell, she had no uh, brain waves because her pupils were fixed and dilated. They put her on a breathing machine, and I've talked to the medical doctor for, for hours, and he said, I would have given her, by the way, he was a pediatric brain specialist, so he had double, a double uh, specialization, and he said, uh, I would have given her a, uh, a one in a thousand chance of living, a one in 10,000 chance with brain function. But they hooked her up, and very shortly afterwards, I think it was three days, <clears throat> she came to, but spontaneously. They didn't do something new or give her new medicine. She came to, and she looks up, and she said, hey, you're the doctor that saved me in the, in the, uh, when I was brought in. Thank you. Where's the other doctor, the tall one? And he said, I'll go get him. Now, he was an agnostic. Mm -hmm. And he's thinking, what's this about? And he went down the hall, got the other guy, brought him down, and she talked long enough that these doctors took notes for about an hour. And she described things. One of them was an angel came and talked to me. Well, there's no test for angels, but that is an interesting little testimony. And she said that first night, the angel allowed me to look into my parents' home, and they're starting to say, okay, this is contact points of the real world, so we want to know if there's something verifiable. She talked about where her dad was sitting, what he was doing, her, her brother went upstairs to play, her sister went upstairs. Oh, okay, what were they playing with? So they're taking notes. Was it Monopoly? Was it a doll? Was it, what was it? And mom was cooking dinner, okay? What was mom cooking? Oh, it was um, a, a chicken and rice dish, chicken and rice. Okay, and then mom and the family comes in. Oh, my baby's all right, everything's fine, this is wonderful. And before they could, anybody could talk, the doctor said, what'd you make for dinner two nights ago? I mean, it was only two nights before. Oh, hey, it was nothing. It was uh, this chicken and rice dish. I got, oh, wow. Now, I don't know exactly how far the house, house was from the hospital. I'm guessing normal house, two, three miles anyway. And she reported all these things. And she was seven years old when it happened. This has been written up in medical, uh, it's been written up in a medical journal for sure. And she's been a frequent guest on television. This was years ago when it first uh, yeah. started. So there's one from a distance. And there are many impressive distance ones. Yeah, you've got some in other states. Uh, the longest one I've seen is 1,250 miles away. What happened? Well, the person went for surgery, and while they were in the middle of surgery, they, were, they had a cardiac arrest, the bad kind, and they were out for 30 minutes. Now, 30 minutes is a long time. Well, when he and his wife, reported in the same book by Jan Holden, um, he and his wife went up to Milwaukee, I think, to have this surgery, but they had somebody house-sitting for them in Florida. And he just, all of a sudden, when he was up there trying to kill the time, he looked in on his house in Florida and meant, noticed several things the guy was doing. And the guy was taking mail and piling it on the dining room table. Not a big deal. But he saw a magazine that was not your normal American-looking magazine. He took note of it. When he got out of the hospital, he asked the fellow, what were you doing on this first night? Well, I was doing this. He goes, 
anything like this. And he did this little tiny drawing. And it was very close to what, what was going on. He made a drawing before the guy told him what he was doing. Yeah. And that magazine, it looked so different because it was not an American magazine. It came from Western Europe. And it was still sitting there at the dining room table when he got back home. It was 1,250 miles away during a cardiac arrest, which means it's one of the most highly evidential ones. Now, here's one that's a little out, but it's a little closer. Um, and it's a cute one told in the same book by uh, Jan Holden. By the way, in that book, 109 cases, in order to be included in that book, anything the NDE or reports has to be verified by a third party or you don't get into the book. Mm -hmm. So pretty good uh, source there. This, this woman was going in to be operated on and her two grandmothers and her father were present. I don't know how many others, but those three for sure. And after they took her for surgery, they went down to the hospital cafeteria. Her dad was a smoker. Her one grandmother used to be a smoker. And the third one would all, was known around the family. I wouldn't touch those cancer sticks. I've never smoked one in my life and I'm sure not going to start now. Always complaining. Don't mention cigarettes around her. You know, it's going to be horrible. So she's there and she all of a sudden zips down to where they're eating. And I guess they're pretty nervous, pretty serious surgery. And dad pushes away from the table and says, I'm going to go outside and get a smoke. The grandmother who used to smoke said, I'm going with you. Can I have one of your cigarettes? And the third one who said, I won't touch those cancer sticks said, I think I need a cigarette too. And they went outside and the young lady watched all three of them smoke. And later she said, were you smoking? Yes, dear, I was smoking. Now, some of them are just kind of funny like that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but she was out. So I want that's you to at a distance. I want you to stop right there because sure. we're going up the ladder of, yep. of tough cases, okay? And we've only got about seven minutes left in this program. Right. And I want to talk about why we're even presenting this information, okay? You've got people that are Christian. You've got people that are non-Christians. You've got people that are saying, goodness sakes, what does this mean, okay? And why are we actually doing this program and telling them this information? What's the bottom line as far as we're concerned here? I think the bottom line, Christians like to talk, we use the word apologetics. We like to talk about evidence and some of it's for religion in general, some of it's for Christianity in particular. Religion in general might be uh, the Kalam cosmological argument. Where Does they, God exist? During the Middle Ages, they were Muslim philosophers who brought the argument to the fore. Today, it might be intelligent design. It might be fine tuning. And it just says some religion is probably true, but doesn't distinguish between religions. But then when Christians talk about the resurrection of Jesus, or was Jesus a miracle worker? Uh, did Jesus predict his resurrection ahead of time? We're talking about things that are more specifically Christian. So I think NDEs are in that general category. It would be next to intelligent design, fine tuning, the Kalam cosmological argument, because for atheists, the one two punch that they don't want to be true, number one, God, number two, afterlife. So they're the two things Bertrand Russell said, that's what atheists don't like. First of all, we're talking about a category that's very important in terms of philosophy of religion. But for my interest in resurrection, I would argue if there's an afterlife, don't do this thing with me where you say, well, wow, the evidence for the resurrection is the best evidence I've ever seen, but I don't believe in that realm. Okay, if I already show you there's a realm, now are you more interested in my data? And I think it gives me a real segue into talking about the resurrection. Yeah, and I think we have to talk about one of the things that uh, you, you, uh, you describe is that when you were in your kind of skeptical years at Michigan State, yep. okay, and uh, you, were, you were doing all kinds of research on the resurrection. Right. One of the things that stood out to you was that Jesus Christ, among all the religious leaders in the world, is the only one that predicted in advance that he would die and he would rise again. And then he's the only one that actually did die and there's evidence that he did uh, come forth from the grave and he spoke to people and they touched him and uh, he gave them information and it wasn't just one person or two persons, it was groups of 12, groups of 500 or more and uh, women, men, different circumstances, uh, walking along a path down at the beach or near the lake, all of these different things about Jesus 
and it struck you that he was different from all the other religious leaders. He was unique. There now, are about keep six going. to eight different categories. For example, we often think, oh, a bunch of founders of major world religions. Not all of them. Some of them were founded by prophets, but some of them at least had to claim to be God, right? Jesus is the only founder of a major world religion who said he was deity. He's the only one. That's it. I mean, it wouldn't be said, to, uh, to think about the uh, Jewish faith. You wouldn't say that about Moses, wouldn't say it about David, wouldn't say it about Daniel. They're great people, but they never said they were the Son of God. That would just be sickening to them to, to right. someone to. So Jesus is in a separate category. Now, anybody can claim anything. To me, his two most unique claims were he's the Son of God and he holds the door to eternal life. Almost every religious founder says, I'm bringing you the path to life. And, he, and here's the path. Jesus is the only one who says, I am the path. He makes an ontological comment about, yeah, we, some people want keys. I am the key. Uh, I'm the shepherd. I'm the only way into the yeah. sheep pen. He says, so, I will bring you in. I will give you the eternal life as a gift free if you believe in me. Right. As opposed to good works or something else. So these are true. But I think anybody can claim anything. Mad men can claim things. But when you, as the old saying goes, put your money where your mouth is, I, I'm going to rise from the dead. And then you do. It's like, whoa, who are you? Because right away you intuitively know if you can predict it, that means you're a player in the saga and you know, if you know what's going to happen, you are clued into the worldview significance of this event. It's not just the resurrection. It's the resurrection of the one who claimed to be the son of God, who claimed to hold the keys to the kingdom. Oh, that one. Okay, now go, keep talking. See, there's, once you get the worldview around it, it becomes a lot more. And to me, the NDEs help weave that worldview around the event of which the resurrection is the center. Yeah, and tell me, and tell the folks that are listening, how the skeptics are reacting to this information. They, like you say, if you're an atheist, there's two things you don't want. You don't want God and you don't want to have an afterlife. What is this evidence doing to their views? Playing with it. What because are they, what you're are they citing saying? evidence where you're not supposed to have evidence. By the way, if those are the first two no-nos, God and afterlife, the next one is an objective ethical standard. Because I don't want to be told what I can do with my life and what I can't. What follows from resurrection? God, afterlife, and a standard, an ethical standard. You know, I'm not happy with what you're doing. So, again, you might introduce me to somebody who's a potential candidate, you know, for, for a marriage. But if I don't want to be married, I'm going to resist, even though you're my best friend, I'm going to resist your suggestions if I don't want to get married. Give me a couple so, of atheists that are uh, talking like that. What are they saying? Well, the, the, again, the one I started out with this, this uh, series on uh, NDEs, I think the thing they say is, the real honest ones are going to say, you've got some pretty good evidence for an afterlife. You do. And I don't know right now what I would say against it. In fact, I don't have to give you any, any particular theory against it because any theory will work because there's no world like the one you're talking about. So my, in my world, which is the workaday world where I've never seen Nardia or Oz, um, I'm not inclined to believe it because there's no world. Now, if I say, uh, excuse me, between nine and 20 million Americans claim to have had an NDE, I think you better be a little more open to this world I think the confluence of these things might make me want to, to use my analogy, might make me want to get married a little bit more if that's the way my life is going to have final meaning. Yeah. You want to say, I do to Jesus. I do to Jesus. Exactly right. All right, folks, we're going to uh, continue. Dr. Habermas is taking us up the ladder here of how the scientists, the medical doctors catalog a person's getting really dead, okay? And we're going to get to the extreme cases next week uh, where all the machines say this person is really, really dead, okay? But he's having a near-death experience and miraculously he comes back and he tells them some fantastic information. I want you to hear some of the tough cases next week. I hope that you'll join us.
Do you think that there is scientific evidence for life after death? Numerous scientific studies have been performed to evaluate the accounts of people who have been pronounced clinically dead. Yet surprisingly, some people have returned to life with amazing accounts of where they had been and what they had seen and heard. But their material, physical bodies never left the room where the doctors pronounced them dead. Such experiences compel scientists to ask, is there more to our lives than just our physical bodies? Is it proof that after our material bodies die, we continue to exist somewhere? If so, where? And since Jesus died and physically rose again, where does he say we will go after we die? The three programs in this series are called, Is There Scientific Evidence for Life After Death? And it's available on DVD for a gift of $39. And then second, for the past century, secular historians have argued that the resurrection and deity of Jesus were teachings developed by Christians long after Jesus lived. But now there is evidence that shows within 24 months of his crucifixion, many historical facts and beliefs about Jesus' deity, death, and resurrection were known by early Christians and passed along to others. This evidence is found in early sermon summaries or belief statements of Christians called creedal statements. And we present this evidence in our two programs with Dr. Gary Habermas called, What Did Christians Believe Within 24 Months of Jesus' Resurrection? And it's available on DVD for a gift of $29. And then third, we're making available our recent series called The Historical Evidence for the Resurrection that even skeptics believe. Dr. Habermas explains why the majority of 4,000 critical New Testament scholars now agree on 12 historical facts about the deity, death, and resurrection appearances of Jesus to his disciples. The five programs in this important series are available on DVD for a gift of $49. And finally, you may order all three of these series together, containing all 10 TV programs, for just $99 or you may order any one of these three series by themselves. But to order now, call us at 1-800-805-3030. That's 1-800-805-3030. Or you may order these series at our website at jashow.org.